Hi, and welcome to our video on energetic cooperation. This video is a little bit different from the other videos in the energy unit in that it's not going to focus on the details of chemical processes or enzymes or anything like that. Instead, it's going to look at how biological systems work together in order to increase their energetic efficiency. And I couldn't think of any better example of this than deep sea hydrothermal vent ecosystems. Unlike almost every other ecosystem on the planet, hydrothermal vent ecosystems do not get their initial energy input from the sun. Instead, hydrothermal vent ecosystems are powered by the actions of symbiotic bacteria that live inside the tissues of the organisms that inhabit the vents. These bacteria carry out a chemosynthetic process that uses sulfur-containing compounds that are released by the earth to power the autotrophic production of food molecules. This is a great example of how organisms cooperate at the most intimate levels to maximize their energetic efficiency in biological systems. The question that we're going to be looking at in this video is how do cooperative interactions increase energetic efficiency? We're going to look at a couple of different examples. We're going to look at some cellular examples. We're going to look at some animal examples. We're going to look at some plant examples, and we'll look at some microbial examples as well. It's important to understand that these are just examples and they're meant to illustrate a larger notion, which is that it's cooperation between different parts of an organism and between different organisms that leads to an increase in energetic efficiency. We've actually already seen this when we considered the relationships between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are much larger and more complex than prokaryotic cells. And the reason for this is because of the increased cooperation that results from the increased compartmentalization that we see in eukaryotic cells. Because eukaryotic cells have more parts, those parts can interact in ways that increase the overall cooperation of the organism, leading to the larger size of the cells, and of course, multicellularity in several of the eukaryotic lineages. Before we move on, let's just clear up one quick misconception that's related to this topic. Aerobic respiration and photosynthesis do not require eukaryotic organelles. They only require membranes. As long as you have membranes where you can separate out regions of the cell and arrange the proteins that are required, the electron transport chain and ATP synthase, you can carry out aerobic respiration and photosynthesis. These processes evolved originally in prokaryotes before becoming established in eukaryotes. And as we know from our understanding of, of endosymbiosis, they only became established in eukaryotes through the endosymbiotic origins of chloroplasts and mitochondria. Let's jump up a few levels of complexity and look at examples of cooperation in multicellular organisms. Let's start with animals. The complexity of animals is entirely a function of cooperation. Let me demonstrate. Here's a human. That human can exist because of the cooperation between the different body systems that comprise that human being. Specifically, the respiratory system, where gas exchange occurs, the digestive system, where nutrients and food are taken into the body, the excretory system that gets rid of metabolic wastes, and the circulatory system that transports all of these materials to all the cells in the body. Without the cooperation of all of these systems working together, animals could not exist. Unsurprisingly, when we look at these systems up close, we see a very tight coupling between different parts of these systems. Here are two quick examples. Intestinal villi are the interface between the digestive system and the circulatory system. Digested food enters into the circulatory system by diffusing through the cells that make up the lining of the villi and entering the circulatory system at the capillaries that run throughout each villus. Similarly, in our lungs, we have an interface between our respiratory system and our circulatory system. Incoming air enters into each alveolus and diffuses through the walls of the alveoli into the circulatory system. And waste gases like carbon dioxide and water diffuse out of the capillaries and into the air, which is then expelled from the body. We can do this for every other system that we talked about in the previous slide. And you probably should try it just to see if you have a handle on this. But let's move on to plants. Plants are really no different from animals in that they too have body systems, but they really have two systems. They have a shoot system and a root system. The root system transports water and nutrients from the soil to the shoot system, and the shoot system transports the food that it produces through photosynthesis to the root system. Let's zoom in on a plant organ, a leaf, and see how the leaf is organized to look at the cooperation between the different systems. At this level of resolution, we can already see vascular tissue. Vascular tissue in plants exists to facilitate the transport of materials from the roots to the leaf and from the leaf 
to the roots. Xylem tissue takes water from the roots and brings it up to the leaves, while sugar that's produced at the leaves is transported throughout the rest of the plant using phloem cells. These xylem and phloem are organized as vascular bundles that run throughout the entire plant. Zooming in even further, we can see that the leaf itself is organized to maximize photosynthetic efficiency. The photosynthetic activity occurs in the mesophyll cells in the leaf, while the gas exchange that's required for photosynthesis occurs through specialized openings in the leaf that are called stomates that allow the oxygen that is produced during photosynthesis to exit the leaf and allow the carbon dioxide that's required to enter. Of course, cooperation isn't just limited to multicellular organisms and their systems. We see cooperation in all domains of life, including in microbial communities. A great example of this is in the gastrointestinal tracts of the ruminants, a group of herbivorous mammals that eat grasses, animals like goats, cows, and sheep. Mammalian cells have no capacity to break down the cellulose that makes up a large part of the incoming ruminant diet. But the ruminant digestive tract has been adapted in such a way that large communities of diverse groups of bacteria that do have the enzymes necessary to break down cellulose can exist inside of large expansions of the stomach compartments of the ruminant. As the ruminant eats plant matter, that plant matter moves into its digestive tract where it is exposed to these bacteria who produce the enzymes necessary to break down the cellulose into the glucose that the ruminant's body cells can use for cellular respiration. This process also involves a lot of regurgitating the chewed and fermented fermented plant matter, which is called cud, and then swallowing it again, and so on and so forth, Wh whatever. Just be glad that you are not a ruminant and that you get your food other ways. We see cooperation in microbes pretty much anywhere we look. One of the cooler examples are what are known as biofilms, which are diverse groups of microbes living that live together and chain their metabolisms together such that the end products of one organism's metabolism are the starting point for the next, and so on and so on. By existing in these diverse communities, these microbes can exploit environments where they would not be able to live if they attempted to do so separately from the rest of the microbial community. Which is another great example of how cooperation not only increases metabolic efficiency, it also expands the available habitats and niches that organisms can exploit through virtue of that cooperation. Thanks so much for watching this video on cooperation in energetic systems. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe, compare, and contrast the examples that were discussed in this video. What are they? How are they similar? How are they different? Also make sure that you can explain how cooperative strategies in cells, animals, plants, and microbial communities all work to increase energetic efficiency. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.